Just because we can do something doesn't mean to say that um, we should. You know, and certainly as technologists and, and technophiles, you know, we get seduced by, by nice, bright, shiny things. And I think really fundamentally understanding what's the value that it brings to our customers. And if there is no value there, just because it's bright and shiny, as you said, it could be a, a distraction. That was Colin Bodell from a company called Bazaar Voice. And they're a leading tech company that's helping brands and retailers better connect with their customers through data-driven insights, reviews, and interactive shopping experiences. But our conversation today is particularly relevant because in an era marked by the rise of virtual and augmented reality, especially given the recent surge in interest to the metaverse, we find ourselves at a crucial intersection of technology and consumer behaviour. Now, according to Bizarre Voice's shopping preference report, 59% of consumers want to see AR and VR implemented in physical retail environments. So how is this going to reshape how we shop and what does it mean for retailers? So I want to delve into this double-edged sword that is AI in e-commerce. And I'll also want to delve into the double-edged sword that is AI in e-commerce, with its promises to enable better customer experiences on one hand, but also poses risks in terms of review authenticity on the other. But enough from me. Buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, it's time for me to beam your ears all the way to Austin, Texas where today's guest is ready to talk about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Colin. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Colin Bodell. I am the CTO of Bizarre Voice, which I'm sure very few people have heard of because we're a B2B company. So if you're in the industry, perhaps you've heard of us. If uh, you're not, then it's unlikely. Uh, my, my family... I was curious about who I'm working with at any point in time, and uh, it's not a name that registers for them, but it's uh, it's pretty well known in the the ratings and review of social commerce industry. And um, as you may tell from my somewhat uh, wacky, not quite fake English accent, I uh, I grew up. I was born in Liverpool. Uh, I don't think there's much uh, <laughs> trace of a Scouse accent left, but I uh, grew up in Liverpool and then south of Manchester. Only worked in the UK after I graduated for about a year, and then um, came to the United States on a two-week project, uh, which was let me get uh, about thirty-eight years ago. <laughs> so, uh, and I think I still got my return ticket lying around somewhere. I've got, of course, I've been backwards and forwards a lot, but uh, I uh, quite liked uh, the United States, and I've lived in Seattle, the San Francisco Bay Area, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lived in New York City for a bunch of years, so I'm living the the fun hobo lifestyle. Oh, fantastic. Uh, do you miss anything about home? Uh, whether it be Liverpool, the UK, or, or anything in between, is there anything <laughs> you miss now? Um, fish and chips. Oh, my yeah. wife's consternation. Um, because, of course, they're not the most healthiest thing on the planet. But uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the things I do when I land back in the UK is make sure that a uh, good fish and chip shop is, uh, is on my agenda pretty soon after getting back. Love it. And Bizarre Voice is a great name for a company. Is there a story behind the name? It was it was way before I started, but you know, what is a bazaar? Not not bizarre, but bazaar. Uh, it's a place yeah. where it's a marketplace where people go shopping. And um, you know, we we are all about the shopping experience and the voice, the authentic voice of the uh, of the customer and customers, you know, people that buy product sharing their experiences, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, and helping others make uh, a wise, hopefully a wise purchasing decision uh, based on um, their their peer group. And one of the things that put you on my tech radar was when I was reading about your shopper preference report, I think it was 59% of consumers are interested in AR and VR technologies in physical stores. So can you tell me more about that and the specific use cases that you might envision for these technologies and how they could redefine the retail landscape? Yeah, and um, you know, not notwithstanding, uh, you know, working at Bizarre Voice now, but in my career, I spent uh, uh, eight years at um, Amazon, running uh, the website platform for for Amazon from when they were uh, not quite a small company, but uh, uh, getting beginning to get bigger company. And then I've been CTO at um, Time Inc. in New York City, American Eagle Outfitters, a vertical uh, retail apparel company uh, in the United States, about a thousand stores. 
uh, CTO at Groupon, and there was a VP of engineering for for Shopify Plus for for a couple of years. And you know, a consistent experience through all of those is, you know, tying together the words the worlds of e-commerce and brick and mortar. And uh, you know, the, the the consumer journey. I know when I shop, I'll do some research online. I might go into a store, especially if I want to try something on, because you know, getting clothing, especially, and getting it shipped to you, and, and it doesn't quite fit. Shipping it back is is quite the pain. So I want to do a bunch of research online, but you know, many times I want to go and experience, touch, feel things inside a store. Of course, as soon as I walk into a store, um, you know, I don't have a laptop in front of me. Okay, I've got a mobile device, so I can I can be checking up on things. But you know, it's it's fussy. You you've got to be pulling things out of your pocket, trying to connect what you're reading online to what's going on in the store. And and if I take just the the, the sort of purest view of the opportunity. As a consumer, I'd love to walk into a store and as I'm looking at something, have all the information around me um, without having to, to, to hit buttons and ask questions, but all of the contextually rich information around me to, uh, to, to enable me to make the, the, the wisest decision. You know, I can bring up reviews and ratings uh, online. There's some stores that we work with, um, uh, Media Market in, uh, in Germany. Um, you know, have ratings and reviews either at end on end apps of uh, displays or, or or throughout physical displays, and people can pop up you know reviews and ratings there that are, are you know contextually tied to what they're seeing. But you've still got to push a few buttons. You've still got to walk around a little bit. I'd love a world where you know I walk up to um, a whole stack of of jeans and a screen above me, um, you know, pops up information based on my proximity. Based on the proximity to um, you know the items in front of me, and gives me the information. Ideally, recognizes who I am and things that I've put in a, a short list. Narrow me down. Tell me where those things are. Tell me what other people are saying about them. What I should be looking out for. What I should be concerned about. But do it all without me having to ask. That'd be the the perfect um, uh, experience. And then it's just a matter of working backwards and how step by step. Can can we in the industry bring those two worlds together and make it as, as seamless as as we possibly can? And the report also suggests I think something like thirty percent of people in the US anticipate a regular usage of the metaverse within three to five years. And I know things have calmed down a little bit this year because everyone's hyped up about Gen AI. But the fact of the matter is, Apple are releasing a headset. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all the usual suspects are working on devices. So it's easy to see how quickly. These things can escalate too, but I'm curious, how do you at Bizarre Voice plan on integrating services like this rapidly evolving virtual space? Because I know it's very early, we've got, we've got to hold our excitement a little, but it seems inevitable that that's where we're going. I, yeah, and I, I, I think you're spot on with the inevitable. You know, technology gets cheaper, it gets faster, it gets lighter weight. I mean, I really liked what, what Google were doing uh, that have now stopped doing with, with Google Glass. I mean, yeah. you know, VR headsets, and, and my experience with VR goes back, I mean, you know, decades. I mean, I've had multiple instances of HTC Vives. I've been through the, the Oculus range, and I like to play around with technology. But the idea of, of putting on, you know, a fairly clunky, heavy, somewhat expensive headset to go shopping it, it's still a distance away. The, the, the tech is getting there, but it's it's clunky. When I have a pair of glasses or even contact lenses or even have it lasered directly into my eyes, plugged directly into my brain, and I can blend the virtual and the real world seamlessly together, you know that that's that's the you know that's the 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 ultimate uh, opportunity here. But like so many well, you know uh, paths of technology, you start, Plunky, and you refine, and you refine, you refine. You know, when when Kennedy said in '61, "We're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade," it took a decade and and billions of dollars to be able to do that, and a lot of failure along the way. And I think it's it's behooven on all of us to to experiment and play. And yeah, there was a lot of hype around the 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 metaverse. I think if if we ask those same questions to people now about the metaverse, the the majority answer would be meta what. Um, because it, it got a lot of hype and then it died away. I mean, much like uh, EFTs. I mean, EFTs, anybody these days? Yes. So, you know, you got, but you've got to pay attention. You don't know necessarily when something is going to get legs. 
uh, and get some some urgency behind it. And I think it's you know you don't want to be too soon, but you sure as heck don't want to be too late. So I think you know VR will will keep on developing. Apple's product, you know, it's at a price point where you know it's it's really intended and will only get bought by professional uh, use. You know, people doing uh, uh, augmented reality, you know, assembling planes, cars, what have you, high tech. Um, but but you know, there's a lot of experimentation going on, and I think it'll get better and better. And um, you know, everything starts off a bit clunky and and then gets refined over time. The the augmented reality. I think is 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 probably got a, a much um, more immediate set of opportunities. I was buying a pair of shoes uh, a few days ago and pulled up an app where I could stick my legs out and show the shoes on my feet, and it allowed me to um, you know to look at them and move my foot around and get a pretty good sense of what they're going to look like when I'm wearing them. And then you 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 take that further along, and it's like well, not just how they look at my feet, but also how they match with. You know the the jeans or the t-shirt that I'm that I'm wearing, and even further, put me in the environment where I'm going to be wearing this stuff. Is it a wedding? Is it a bar with peanuts on the floor? I don't know. Give give me the opportunity to to take a look at that. And I think stepwise we'll we'll get better and better at that. Again, the processing power on on uh, mobile devices is is tremendous, and with ML AI, there's so much we can intuit and infer that will allow us to put the right images, the right experience, literally on people's feet uh, as they want to see it. So I think it's, it's, it's to me, fundamentally, it's, it's playing around, it's experimenting. Um, you know, it took, I don't know what the number was, 500, you know, iterations for Edison to get yeah. the, uh, the, the light bulb right. And he said, well, it wasn't 500 failures. It was, you know, 500 steps in learning. And anybody that's not learning like that is not experimenting, I think, is, is going to lose out ultimately. The ones that pour too much money into it and, and ju- try and jump ahead, they either make the market, they define the market, uh, or at least they're able to uh, to keep up as uh, as developments come along. So I think there's going to be a lot of lot of churn, a lot of change, but it's it's all about bringing those worlds together and making life uh, that much better for the end user consumers. They're the one that that pay all of our bills, so uh, let's let's pay attention to them. Yeah, it's been an incredible journey. You're probably too young to remember this, but. I still remember myself. Uh, well, I'm going to date myself here. I still remember when there was, I think it was the Tobytronic 3D was released in the early '80s. It oh, was yeah. like a, it's like a gaming thing, but you you held it up to your eyes. It was like the early iteration of a, a headset. But it's been it's been quite a journey, hasn't it, from those those days in the '80s and thinking of where virtual reality will take us to to where we're going next and augmented reality. Well, and I, I, you're not uh, you're not dating yourself, Neil. I graduated in 1984. So um, yes, I'm familiar with the the toys that came around. And look, toys, you know, kids kids play with toys. It's it's called play. Well, adults will take those same things and muck around with them, and it's called experimentation. It's the same thing. It's becoming familiar, aware of it, and getting some fun and enjoyment out of it. Because that's fundamentally what shopping is. If it's if it's a boring, mundane task, you're not going to do it. Uh, if it's if it's much more entertaining. Uh, and immersive, then you're going to take greater, you know, advantage of it. It's better for the consumer. It's more they're more informed, and it's better for companies because they can sell more. And although there's only a few months left of 2023, if we go back to the beginning of the year, I think many business leaders and retailers were somewhat blindsided by the uh, mainstream adoption of AI, in particular Gen AI, of course. And AI can be both a boon and a bane for e-commerce. So I'm curious. How does Bizarre Voice utilize AI to enhance that shopping experience while also mitigating the risk posed by things like fake uh, fake uh, AI and AI-generated reviews, et cetera? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, if I unpack that, there's this, which is a great, it's a great question. There's, uh, I unpack it to, to sort of authenticity as the first one yeah. and, and just, you know, leveraging ML AI to put, you know, right answers, right information in front of, front of people at the right time. From from an authenticity perspective, yeah, we want to make sure that the reviews that we collect, that we share, that we syndicate, that all of our clients have the opportunity to uh, to put on their sites are as as, as authentic um, as possible. Meaning they're written by real humans that have really experienced the product. Now you know there's a there's a constant battle going on because companies know that um, a large set of very authentic reviews help drive conversion. Customers like to read 
the good, the bad, the ugly, get a balanced view. Um, and in fact, I remember some years ago, I came across a, um, a company that you know would, would suppress all reviews that weren't five stars. And I spent time educating them that that's not in your best interest. Five, all five star ratings don't convert as well as you know a preponderance of five stars, but a but a balance of you know four, three, two, and one. The the, the chances that any product is perfect for everybody that ever consumes it is incredibly low. And consumers are smart; they they get that. So don't don't be suppressing it. You know, be as authentic as you possibly can, and you know that builds up long term trust. If I read reviews and then make a purchase and my personal experience matches those reviews, then you know my lifetime value to that consumer is goes up. I'm, I'm going to come back and uh, and take advice from them and and the, their prior customers um, as often as I as I as I need as I can. So authenticity is super important, and we've actually used ML AI techniques for for many many years, um, as well as other technology fingerprinting. Um, you know the the source of reviews, the volume at which they come in, the speed at which they come in, to to identify the things that are not uh, real consumer, real people generated, and then just take them out of our system to ensure that we're we're getting the highest degree of authenticity we poss- possibly can. The, the the benefit of that is twofold. One, uh, you know, on site people are reading reading real reviews, but secondly, as we apply our MLAI techniques to take the content of those reviews and maybe summarize them out, um, uh, provide you know, augmented information around those, then it's good data in leading to good data out. If you start with a set of reviews that are, are less than authentic, then it becomes garbage in and then garbage out. So yeah, in terms of, of what we're doing with MLAI, um, you know, we know that the space is moving fast, as you said, generative AI moving yeah. very, very fast. And by the way, we absolutely uh, do not and will not generate reviews. Again, they've got to be from real people with their real experiences. But we're, we're doing a lot of experiments. We've released a whole bunch of capabilities. We've got a bunch more in pilot test at the moment and a huge backlog that we work with our, uh, our key clients to select from. To advance into into uh, testing, hypothesis, uh, you know, validation, verification, and then development, and then final final release. Um, and you know, one that we're, we're we've just rolled out, or beginning to roll out at the moment, is a thing called Review Coach. So when I sit down to write a review, imagine writing a review about mayonnaise. What can you say about mayonnaise? Uh, it's white. Um, it's tasty. Yeah. What else? I, yeah. Yeah. I, Tangy, maybe. I mean, it, you start to run things very quick. What we do um, for products like that is we look at all reviews and pull from them what have other people talked about, and not just with mayonnaise, but with other other condiments. Um, what do people, you know, generally think and talk about? And then we we throw in front of of somebody writing a review some keywords. Not, and we've not done a keyword search. We sort of mined out through AI and ML large language models the the sort of sentiment. And there might be a whole bunch of keywords like um, shelf life, um, taste, uh, you know, how well it, it pours, do you scoop, do you pour, but, but some, some prompts, if you like. We call it review coach, such that when that somebody's writing a review, they can say, oh, yes, it's, it's white and it's tasty. Oh, but it's, you know, hey, I've had it on my shelf for 12 months and it's still fresh, or I've had it in the refrigerator for 12 months and it's still fresh and it pours well, or you've got to scoop it out. Um, uh, it doesn't have, you know, uh, you know, what's, what's its calorie count, things like that. Uh, is it, is it uh, vegan or non-vegan? Well, I guess if it's mayo, it's non-vegan, but there you go. So, but we put these prompts up and what, what it does is allows people to say, oh, okay, yeah, I, I do have an opinion about that. I hadn't even really thought about it deeply, but viscerally, I do have an opinion. So they'll write longer reviews. They'll write better reviews. They'll write more informed reviews. And actually it becomes almost gamification. That as I'm writing a review using this mechanism, as I talk about each of the prompts, then once the ML system recognizes that I've written something about its taste, its texture, its shelf life, what have you, then it'll just um, you know it'll it'll uh, fill in the uh, the, the or, or, or highlight the uh, the keyword. So the sort of gamification fun is: can I write a review and sort of flash all of these buttons up? And and again, it's still it's honest, it's authentic, but it's much more complete. 
that has value for the, the the brand. It has value for the retailer, and it certainly has value for other consumers that come along. So that's just one example of you know twenty or thirty tests that we've either been running or in the process of running. We try them out with our uh, with our clients, ones that are helping them convert, bring a better product to market, a better service to market. Then they come back to us and say, "Great, yep, let's let's roll that out." So a very rapid iterative development cycle that's very much informed by brands, informed by you know the original manufacturers, by retailers, and also by our experience working with you know tens of millions of uh, of consumers around the world. So it's a fun and exciting time, um, and you know we're, we're only beginning to just scratch the surface. And I think it's uh, it's again it's behoove of us to. Uh, you know, to make sure we're putting in the right resource at the right time to get uh, tremendously powerful output for all of our for all of our customers. And of course, we are in a period of economic uncertainty at the moment, and retailers do have a pressure to improve their experiences that they provide and also meet the customer expectations. But it's also all too easy to become distracted by shiny tech and lose sight of the problem that they're solving and the ROI and business value that they're delivering. So. As companies increasingly invest in emerging technologies, such as things like VR and AR technologies that we mentioned earlier, are there any key performance indicators that they should be focusing on to better measure the ROI of any tech project effectively? Yeah, and, and Neil, I think you hit the nail on the head, which is uh, the, the bright, shiny things. Yeah. Just because we can do something doesn't mean to say that um, we should. I'm sure that line came out of Jurassic Park somewhere. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's very, very true. You know, and certainly as technologists and, and technophiles, you know, we get seduced by, by nice, bright, shiny things. And I think really fundamentally understanding what's the value that it brings to our customers. And if there is no value there, just because it's bright and shiny, it, it could have, you know, there's no point rolling it out. Or in fact, as you said, it could be a, a distraction. So yeah, the sort of things that I look for is, you know, what's the overall engagement, and you know, it may not be able to intu- into it, but um, being able to test it out on a on a small number of you know vocal and opinionated consumers, I think, is very valuable. We've got a product line called Influencer that um, there's about seven million people that are signed up for it. it. Gives them a chance to experience you know new or revised products coming to market, and that's a very very vocal group of people. And we can try things out with them, just a small subset. And get their feedback, not just on the products, but also on the mechanisms that we apply to help them experience those products. And but it's a, to me, it's all about engagement. And I think a key key point of measurement is engagement. People coming back, uh, you know, periodically. Um, they may not make a purchase today. They may not make a purchase tomorrow. But if they're coming back, if they're engaged, if their questions are getting answered, uh, they're getting all the information that they need. Then that's a that's a good buying signal for the future. I think one of the other things as well, you know, mentioned earlier on about, um, you know, the notion of being able to, uh, you know, see how things certainly in the apparel business will see or look or fit. Um, there's a tremendous problem with returns in the apparel space. You know, people will buy, you know, three or four pairs of jeans at different sizes, see what, which one fix and then ship them back. So the greater accuracy that, that we can help bring to consumers to make the right decision and you know size that you know okay this is a woman's size six and and if the preponderance of response back from the reviews is yeah but it really fits as a as a four or really fits as an eight that's really valuable in, in information for the consumer and will also drive down the amount of returns which are incredibly expensive for uh, you know for retailers to uh, to deal with um, and then, and then I think another thing is the 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 data insights it's not to me just about Taking data and, and feedback from consumers and improving their experience, but those data, those then the signals that come with those data, really valuable information for for brands, for manufacturers themselves to listen to what their consumers are, are saying. Um, we've seen things like, um, you know, a, a particular brand of uh, refrigerator uh, was launched in um, in uh, it was a U.S. refrigerator, but launched in um, in Japan. And a lot of negative feedback about just the size of it not fitting in in smaller Japanese size uh, apartments, um, and there was a, quite a weight of, of feedback in regards to that. We pass that back to the brand. You know that gets uh, you know it's another data point or set of data points that can help inform how they refine not only the the design of their product but also how they market it, who they market it to. 
you know, we know where those sort of comments come back in. Uh, you know, geographically, do they come from people, you know, living in small apartments in a city, or do they come from people in, in perhaps larger properties, larger homes outside a city where, where land and space is, is a little less expensive? So that kind of information, that kind of signal is super valuable as well. It, it uh, does double double duty, we say. And it's interesting you were talking about feedback there. I was chatting to my mum on the phone today before uh, speaking with you, and, and she said to me, when did everyone agree to enter a store, scan their own new pair of jeans and bring their own bag and ultimately serve themselves? And this got me thinking, while VR and AR do offer new and immersive ways to shop, we could in some ways alienate customers who don't have access or are not interested in technology. So how do you propose we, we bridge this digital divide? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, fundamentally by not developing things that are one size fits nobody, or yeah, I guess the industry would say one size fits everybody, which really becomes one size fits nobody. Um, you know, we 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 you know, as an industry, we like to do persona driven development. You know, insert name of person. This is who they are, where they live, how they shop, and that's a that's a good generalization. And I think it's super important that we don't forget the um, the edge cases because those edge cases could be incredibly influential um, they certainly should be respected when you try and boil you know uh, you know a whole you know shades of gray uh, you know a, a complete population down to just a few personas there's value in that it keeps people focused allows us to develop um, and, and stay on track with our development but doing so whilst not forgetting that there are different people with different needs different backgrounds and experiences and being able to accommodate them as much as possible. So personal, you know, personalized experiences, don't tell me how to shop. Give me the opportunity to chart my own course. Um, and also when I, when I make decisions or selections, certainly in e-commerce, um, pay attention to that. And when I come back again, don't default to the, to the standard view of the world. Recognize and acknowledge who I am, what my, my prior experiences and interactions have been. Take advantage of that. I think it's good business, and it's also being deeply respectful uh, of our customers and acknowledging them as as individuals. Um, and then it's a fine line to walk between those two. You know, the the one size fits nobody and the the individualization. But I think it's I think it's achievable. And I I, I know as a consumer myself when I see it or even a, a glimmer of it, I, I really appreciate it. I, I know that there's somebody being thoughtful and considerate. And doing the best they can, rather than just sort of uh, B or C. Then, sorry, you don't exist to us. I think that's a that's a fundamentally losing proposition. And I think as new technologies are increasingly adopted, there's also going to be new regulatory considerations that will uh, inevitably follow too. So, are there any current or upcoming regulations that you think might influence the adoption of VR and AR in retail? Is there anything you're seeing around this? Oh, uh, very much so. I mean, look, I <clears throat> say I lived and worked in the United States for the last thirty-eight years, yeah. and um, the, there's an increasing amount of um, uh, you know governmental and environmental oversight in regards to authenticity of, of reviews. Um, you know, very easy these days to set up a website, fake generate a whole bunch of reviews, and scam people into <laughs> into buying your product. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, that everybody, you know, the industry as a whole suffers for that. So, you know, FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and, and other uh, U.S. governmental um, agencies, you know, really ramping up their uh, intention to, um, you know, make this a, a, a level playing field, an equal playing field, an honest and authentic playing field. And we keep very close to them and, you know, very supportive of all of their steps because, you know, one poor performer. Um, can can really you know taint the uh, the rest of the industry, which is quite a shame, and it, it lowers overall consumer trust. And likewise, in you know in Europe, um, you know we we all spend many years you know grappling and dealing with uh, things like GDPR, but there are other regulations that um, you know they're coming out of the EU and of course out of the out of the UK, a lot of similar thought process to really ensure that. Um, you know the experience that, that that shoppers you know get online is is authentic. It's truthful. It's honest, um, and they can make wise decisions without losing their their hard hard earned brass. So um, yeah, it, it, we we stick very close to that. We we encourage, we support, and I think it's 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 beneficial for the consumer, and it's sure as heck beneficial for the for the business and for the for the industry overall. 
And we were t- talking about reviews a few moments ago, and, and especially uh, generative AI in crafting reviews. Now, there is a lot of potential for that to be misused, of course. And do you think there's a moral responsibility for platforms like Bazaar Voice to police this space? And, and how do you balance innovation with ethical considerations? Because it feels like it's it's quite a fine balance there. It it very much is. I mean, fundamentally, yes. I mean, I, I you know, over the... The last few minutes we've been, you know, I've mentioned authenticity probably half a dozen <laughs> times. It, it's super important. I, I tend to, you know, put myself in the seat of, of anybody. I, you know, I'm as much a, a developer as I am a consumer. Um, and I want to be treated, you know, honestly and respectfully. If I go into a restaurant and get, you know, lousy service, don't care how good the food is, you know, it's part of the experience. I'm not going to go back. Um, and, and such is with, um, you know, with, uh, with AI. So I think there is there is both an ethical, ethical and, and moral responsibility. We have, um, you know, a set of principles that that we adhere to internally, include up to and including, you know, we will not generate any um, any reviews. And in fact, any reviews that we detect that have been machine generated, even if done hand on heart, you know, with good intentions, uh, we don't let them through our systems. But yeah, I believe you know both my company, but also the industry has got that moral and, and ethical responsibility um, to treat people as, as people, as humans, not to be um, dismissive, dismissive or, or divisive, to be super respectful of, um, of everything that, that they're interested in that, that, that they want. Um, and, you know, we'll be evolving, we'll continually evolve our, our guidelines. We take a look at, you know, whether other, other industry guidelines, either bodies or, or other companies. And we want to select the best. We we want to be, um, you know, as authentic and as as clear as we possibly can in our dealings, both internally and how we think about our projects. And then we can put our hands on our hearts and express to people um, how we're going about this. And I think it's important um, that not only you know do we do we use ML AI, but when we're sharing it with our uh, clients for them to use, is not only tell them what the feature or the capability will do. But how it goes about doing what it does to be thoroughly transparent about the approach that we take, and then that you know we hope and expect that that you know passes the bar of their standards. But in the event that it doesn't, they've got transparency; they can make their own decisions. But I think our our standards are, are pretty gosh darn high, and and the bar will only get raised. It will it will never be coming down. And you mentioned the word evolving there, and I suspect that you've seen the entire tech industry evolve throughout your career and maybe picked up a few war stories along the way. So to end on a lighthearted note, can you share the funniest or most interesting story that has happened in your career? Because as I said, I suspect there's a few of them, right? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you a, a quick one. I um, <laughs> was on uh, Black Friday in the uh, in the US, you know, the biggest, biggest shopping day of the year. And um, I walked into the, uh, I was working at a large e-commerce company um, and walked into the war room and uh, it was unusually quiet for a Black Friday, you know, groups of engineers and product managers uh, standing around in various corners all sort of muttering to each other. So I walked up to, um, uh, my head of security was making a beeline to me. I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting. And it turned out that um, we'd... uh, Pushed out a um, a little widget on uh, web browsers. It was doing a countdown of um, you know amount of time uh, necessary for a particular offer uh, to be um, uh, to be taken advantage of by customers. And um, you know we tested this pretty pretty thoroughly, and it was it was running very successfully. Anyway, it turned out that instead of it polling to check inventory levels every second, it was polling our systems every millisecond. So the, the, the volume of traffic that was coming in from browsers around the world was going up you know, exponentially. And this was only eight o'clock on, on Black Friday. So you know, the, the question I asked this fellow was, you know, when? Meaning, when are we going to collapse into a heap? And uh, he said, we've got about 90 minutes and then we completely you know, exceed our capacity. And systems will go down. They'll relaunch as soon as they come back up again. All of those browsers around the world are going to be firing off their uh, their requests, and we're going to go down again. And uh, I mean, there was potentially not just you know millions of dollars, but hundreds of millions of dollars on the table for that day. Um, and we had to uh, get very creative about how we went about fixing that and resolving it. We uh, at one point 
exploited a little uh, bug. This is going back way into the 2000s. I think the statutes of limitations are way over by now, but we wound up exploiting a couple of uh, bugs uh, in a uh, in dominant browsers in those days to, um, to actually crash some people's browsers to stop those signals coming in when they reloaded. They got the new widget that was only polling us once a second. Um, so they were in the in the, the the much earlier days of the internet, but things were a lot less stable <laughs> than they are now. But uh, yeah, we had a uh, you know, and of course when we did the uh, the retrospective on that, it was uh, yeah, we we tested at scale, uh, but not at the at the appropriate scale. Um, so uh, yeah, we learned a ton of valuable lessons, and I think look, that's the the, the punchline or the fo- footnote to my um, my career. It's you know, I, I've, I've learned an awful lot through success. I've learned way more by messing up and, and making mistakes left, right, and center. But, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in be bold, uh, experiment, try things out. And um, a failure is not a failure per se. It's an opportunity to learn and, and do better next time. And, uh, you know, when I'm experimenting, you know, I know it might be one experiment out of 100 that's going to be world beating could be the first one. It's more likely to be the 99th because we're leveraging the experience from the earlier failures. That's okay. So don't don't be don't be don't be afraid of experimentation. Um, it, it's a real boost. It's a boon to uh, to getting to the to the final outcome. And, I, and as I say, I'm happy to sit over a, a glass of wine or a beer with anybody and regale them about all of my myriad failures through my career <laughs> because they've they've really been invaluable. What a great story. Absolutely love it. And I completely agree with everything you said there. Although I did have to rein myself in as an XIT change manager from saying, but what was the rollback procedure for implementing this widget? <laughs> but, uh, well, but, no, and actually on that one, you know, that, that was one of the questions I asked. Great, you know, uh, you know, what flip the kill switch. Yeah. yeah. We didn't build one in. So effectively we built a perfect zombie DDoS uh, fleet uh, against ourselves. It was oh, it was exquisitely bad how, how badly we screwed up that day. <laughs> well, I love chatting with you today. And for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about anything we talked about, from the topics, the work you're doing, to the shopper preference report, where would you like to point everyone listening? You know, we have all of our information on www.bizarrevoice.com. <laughs> That's where I go to get my information about the company. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh, we got a lot of the uh, you know the reports and the data, but as we pointed out earlier, things things change. You know, don't take everything uh, you know as gospel. Be be curious, lean in, ask questions. I love answering questions, even the tough ones, especially the tough ones, because it helps me think. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for, again for sharing your insights and expertise around the hype of the VR Renaissance and AI and uh, AR. So much to talk about there, and also the offerings and obstacles for consumers shopping online. And equally, retailers that are utilising this technology and leaving us with a cracking story too. Thanks for joining me today, Con. Oh, it's a pleasure. And that wraps up another episode of Tech Talks Daily. A huge thank you to Colin Bodell for sharing his deep insights into this ever-changing landscape of online retail, augmented by cutting-edge technology like AR and VR, and even AI. And I think it's clear that we're standing on the threshold of a new era for both consumers and retailers, one marked by immersive experiences, but bolstered by data insights that are not without their own unique set of challenges. And for anyone listening, if you want to look deeper into the tech innovations, how they're revamping the whole customer journey, maybe you've got something to add to the conversation today. You know the drill. I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. You can email me at techblogwriteroutlook.com. If you're not following me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn yet, why not? And I say that not just because I want to promote episodes to you every day. I want to create a connection with you and have a dialogue every day. Whereas if you hear something randomly on the 8.03 to work in the morning, that you could just instantly send me a quick DM. So don't just hit the follow. Send me a quick message. Tell me you listen to the show and uh, we can keep this conversation going. So if you do want to follow me on anything, it's just at Neil C. Hughes, nice and easy. And we'll be back tomorrow with another episode. We'll we'll explore another area. But that's it for today. So thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Stranger.